first of all, just, I should say two things. First, that what I'm speaking on is joint work with my PhD student, Andres Riveros of Chile. And uh, the second thing is that this is a meeting in honor of Denis Talley, in case you don't know. And uh, so usually you say something nice about, uh, about the person that the conference is in honor of. But it's not easy with Denis Talley. <laughs> so uh, according to Denis, I first saw him at a NATO conference in the Algarve in the south of Portugal, where I went because I was spending a year in Paris. And at the time, the climate in Paris was horrible. Il pleut tout le temps, il fait froid, et le climat aussi. And the climate in the Algarve of Portugal, on imagine est très bien. Et l'imagination était correcte. C'était très bien. Et ma femme, en particulier, était très contente. Mais là, j'ai donné un exposé, même si c'était une conférence d'automne que j'ai apposé. J'ai apposé l'automne, mais pas le soleil. Euh, on voit le conflit. Mais bon, alors. C'était très bien, sauf le dernier jour, quand les Portugais ont empoisonné ma femme avec les crevettes. <rire> mais euh, mais ce n'est pas un problème. On a roulé directement à Lisbonne. L'hôtel a commandé un médecin qui m'a dit à ma femme que c'était un problème avec son cycle féminin. Donc, on a pris l'avion direct à Paris et euh, on était, tout était réglé. OK. Bon. Alors, euh, mais après ça, euh, je suis allé à Marseille, l'invitation d'Étienne Pardou, où j'ai fait la vraie connaissance de Denis Talley. Et comme peut-être tu sais, Denis Talley travaille au sud de la France. Et le sud de la France est différent que Paris, parce que là, on a le soleil, tout le monde est souriant. Et j'ai dit que peut-être c'est une bon, bonne idée de visiter Denis à la place de Paris. <rire> Et c'est une tradition que je continue aujourd'hui. Alors, <rire> OK, maintenant, il y a, il y a une confusion. Évidemment, euh, M. Lyon a cherché à parler en français, mais il a parlé en anglais. En revanche, Carl Graham cherchait à parler en anglais, mais il a parlé en français. Et donc, je ne sais pas quoi faire. <rire> mais j'ai préparé mes transparents en anglais. Donc, pourquoi pas anglais OK. And somebody here is happy that I'm speaking in English. Yes. My English is actually better than my French, which I think everyone realizes at this point. OK, so the title of this is Cox Construction. One of the nice things about Cox Constructions is that Cox had nothing to do with them. So I was wondering, where did Cox Constructions come from? And so I did some research, and I couldn't figure it out. The earliest reference to a Cox construction I could find was in the work of David Lando. I don't know if you know the work of David Lando, because he's an economist. And, um, but he's one of those rare economists who can talk in complete sentences, has a certain intelligence. And so, I wrote to him and I said, why, did, why are they called Cox Constructions? He says, I don't know. I named them after Cox. So then I realized, because Cox had studied doubly stochastic Poisson processes. And so then I realized that Cox did not invent Cox Constructions, 
but David Lando did, which didn't make sense because he was an economist. And so I questioned him further, and it turns out it was Rick Durrett who invented Cox Constructions because David Lando went to Rick Durrett and asked him, how do I do this? And Rick Durrett said, oh, do this. Well, that's the story anyway. I wrote to Rick Durrett and tried to get the story confirmed, but he has not yet responded. Okay, so um, let's begin. Okay, so we always start, of course, with a filtered probability space. We, I'm not going to use, I hate pointers. Does anybody here hate pointers? Yes, okay, good for you. Yeah, because you know, you go like this, can you actually see anything? <laughs> and because you can't see the red dot, people circle. They go like this, you know? Which personally makes me dizzy. So I don't like pointers, and I, I usually bring a metal pointer, but I forgot. So, uh, at any rate, so what I can do is I can use the, um, I can use the computer's pointer. So suppose we have a filtered probability space and a stopping time t defined on the space, okay? Then if we just formulate st, which is the indicator that little t is bigger than t, that's a submartingale, right? Because it has sample paths which are constant and one jump up and then constant again, so it's a submartingale. And it's zero until the time t, and it's one after it. It's adapted because t is a stopping time, and so everything is nice. Then we can invoke, and this is the deepest theorem this talk uses, the Dube-Meyer decomposition theorem, which says that there exists an increasing predictable process with, uh, with a naught equal to zero, such that if we subtract a t from this increasing process, we get a martingale. Now, it was predictable, and it's also unique, and it's predictable. Now, if t is a predictable stopping time, and I'll explain that, then the indicator t bigger than t is already predictable, and so a is just identically zero. So the only time this is of interest, or it's not trivial, is when the stopping time is not predictable. Okay. So just to remind you, these are very old ideas, and some of you are under 30, or maybe under 40, or maybe under 50. But at any rate, if you're young, you may not be familiar with these ideas. So we can describe stopping times in three classifications. The first one, is a predictable time, and that's where you have a sequence of stopping times increasing to the time in question, always strictly less than it, and, and we say those stopping times announce the time. So if you think about Brownian motion, the first time Brownian motion hits 12, right, then you can, have, you can construct the SN as the first time, SN is the first time it hits 12 minus 1 over n. And that's going, because it has continuous paths, that's going to be strictly increasing, and then it will have t as a limit. Okay? So it's a very simple concept, very good for continuous processes. Now, in the early days of this theory, there was predictable and totally inaccessible, which were not called that. They had different names, but that's not important. And, uh, but my thesis advisor, Ronald K. Gatour, um, found an example of a stopping time that was neither predictable nor totally inaccessible, and those are called accessible times. And this is typical of my thesis advisor. If you have a simple situation, he could always make it more complicated, <laughs> okay? which he saw as the goal of mathematics, to make things as complicated as possible. Those of us who know Gatour, like uh, Nicole 
and Jean Jacod. That's probably everybody <laughs> can, uh, can, can um, oh well. Okay, so, so what, and also n telling you what an accessible time is explains why the other definition is called totally inaccessible, which is usually not explained. So an accessible time, T is, T is accessible if there exists a sequence of predictable times that cover T. So the union of SN, of, uh, sorry, of, ah, I don't know what's going on. The union, this is an interesting tool. You can't put it on the, okay, so you have to be careful where you put this down. I guess most people never put it down. I do. Okay, so, so, the, these, oh, if you just look at the middle equation, these, the, the SN include all the, to, all the omega where T of omega is finite. So in that sense, they cover it, and uh, the equality is, equal almost surely, okay? So that's called accessible if you can cover a stopping time with predictable times. And a totally inaccessible <laughs> means you can't do that. So the probability that our time is equal to a predictable time where when it's finite is zero. So it's the other extreme from predictable. All right, and so, Um, okay. Now, so, if you talk, the other, another ancient theory <laughs> is Markov processes. But Markov processes is important enough that probably it's still taught. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, but at any rate, I, uh, <coughs> there was this mathematician named Gil Hunt at Princeton, who was a brilliant mathematician, but he didn't like to publish papers. And so the powers that be at Princeton said, if you don't publish papers, we can't give you tenure. And they wanted to give him tenure because he was fairly brilliant. So he created a Markov potential theory in a series of papers got tenure, and then never published again. Uh, tenure in the United States is generally speaking the recognition that you're so neurotic that you will continue to publish even when there's no reason. Okay, so, which by and large works. So, so we call them, in honor of Gilbert Hunt, we call a whole big class of Markov processes are called Hunt processes. There's a smaller class called Feller processes, which are named after William Feller, who never had a problem with tenure. I mean, he published. Okay, so, so for a Hunt process, um, stopping times are either predictable or totally inaccessible or a combination of the two. For a Brownian motion, all stopping times are predictable, okay? And uh, we don't have any need for accessible times. And so, so as I said before, what we're interested in, it's in red, is when the stopping time is totally inaccessible. And these are the jump times, can be, can be viewed, thought of as the jump times of a Markov process, because when a Markov process jumps, you just don't see it coming. It's a complete surprise. So the easiest example of a Markov process that jumps is the Poisson process, right? Which is constant, and then jumps up to one, and that's constant for an exponential waiting time, jumps up to two, constant for an exponential waiting time, jumps up to three, and so forth, right? And Poisson processes were mentioned already at this conference. 
So, um, because in America we don't teach Poisson processes unless you're in engineering. To my horror. But at any rate, okay, so, so we're interested in these total accessible times, and why is this? Well, what's an application where they come up naturally is uh, mathematical finance, and in particular in the theory of credit risk. So if you think, you think of a time, now Carl Graham criticized me because I always gave depressing examples. You know, I gave a talk at Ecole Polytechnique, he says, you know, all your examples were when bad things happen. So I tried to think of cheerful examples, like of stopping times, like the first time you fall in love, or, you know, the, the, the first time your mother lets you taste chocolate, if you remember that, I don't know. Um, things like that. So there are good times, just so you know. They don't all have to be bad. But usually in mathematics, we're interested in catastrophes and bad things happening. You know, so for example, one of my favorite examples is a building in southern Florida near Miami Beach uh, called Surfside Tower, which I think was about 20 floors. And at about 1.30 in the morning, when everybody was in bed sleeping, it fell down and killed everybody. But, you know, it's Florida. So, so you kind of expect these things, right? Because in a well-run part of the country of the United States, government has regulations. And they regulate things. They say there's building codes. And you have to build things according to a certain code. But Florida, not so much. OK, so, um, so th these things come up in credit risk when, when uh, something bad happens, such as a company doesn't pay back its debt. Right? So that's, that's an example of a bad event. Or a company goes bankrupt. Right? OK, so. Um, Now, a common assumption in the literature made, which is a good assumption, is assumption two, which is that this, what we call compensator, this process AT, you subtract off to make it a martingale, is of the form zero to T alpha S DS, where alpha S is adapted. Now, there's no requirement in the du Mayer decomposition that AT has to have absolutely continuous paths. But people always assume it without special mention. And so then I became interested in when is this true? When does it have absolutely continuous paths? And in the, it, I don't know if you've read the book of Ethier and Kurtz. It's a great book because in the back, in the very few, last few pages, did you notice there's a flow chart for the book where every theorem and every lemma is connected? You really have to be insane to do something like that. And I asked Tom Kurtz about that. He said, oh, that's Stuart Ethier. I didn't ask Stuart Ethier because he probably would have blamed Tom Kurtz. But at any rate, OK, so the Kurt, Ethier Kurtz criterion that gives you absolute continuity is very simple. It's just you know, what you might expect, the expect, conditional expectation of AT minus AS given FS. Remember, that's the underlying filtration has to be less than or equal to k times t minus s. And it's not hard to see that that would probably give you <coughs> absolutely continuous paths. But it's sufficient. It's not necessary and sufficient. And if you're French, you just can't let it go. You can't have a sufficient condition without it being necessary and sufficient, right? So one of my former PhD students, Yan Zheng, I said, OK, make the, find the necessary and sufficient one. And he did, in the true, trend, in the true French style, which means it's absolutely definitive and totally useless. <laughs> okay, so, so we have a necessary and sufficient condition, which I'm not going to present, for it to be absolutely continuous. However, in the case of a strong Markov-Hunt process, 
it's much easier because we can use a theorem of Chenlar and Jean Chicot, who's going to give a talk later today on the blackboard. Uh, they showed in 1981, can you believe this, 1981? People were actually studying probability in 1981 that any RD valued strong Markov process, which is a hunt process, and which also is a, so it, hunt processes can have jumps, right? And it's also a semi martingale. As long as you're willing to state the theorem up, up to a time change, which you change using a key additive functional clock, can be represented as a solution of a stochastic differential equation driven by two simple things, dt and dwt, where w is standard Brownian motion, and a Poisson random measure. Okay, whose compensator is ds nu dz. So they showed that in 1981, which means that for this talk, we can assume a given that we have a strong Markov hunt process, semi martingale, which can be represented on a space omega f with a filtration, bold face f, and a starting measure px which means that px of x naught equals little x is, is 1, and has the form of this uh, stochastic integral differential equation, okay, where this, the term in the middle line is just sort of truncating the jumps at 1. You can have an infinite number of small jumps, but you can only have a finite number of jumps bigger than 1, and so that's why in the middle term, you have to, you, it's a little bit complicated. But anyway, you can, you can express it uh, this way. Okay. And if you do, um, then we have the following result. For any totally inaccessible stopping time R on a space omega F, F mu, P mu, P mu. Okay, so what is F? So if you have, Oh, this is clever. Oh, no, you didn't hide the chalk. Okay. Ran out of excuses. So if, if you want to have, if you want the uh, distribution of x naught to be mu, you can do that by saying that the p mu of an event A is, is just px of A mu dx. And so the, this, this family of measures here, this p mu, lets, lets you have a Markov process with an arbitrary initial distribution, which means all you really need are the px's. You don't need the p mu's. But once you have a p mu, then you want to complete the filtration with respect to p mu. And um, that's simple, right? You just throw in all the null sets. What's not simple, and a topic which I studiously avoid, is what happens when you want to get the same filtration that works for all the PMUs at once. We're not going to go there. Okay? And uh, then, on this space with the omega F, uh, on the space with omega F, F mu, P mu, you have a predictable process A, such that the indicator tr is our total inaccessible time. So the indicator t bigger than r minus at equals mt is a martingale. And in this case, you know it has absolutely continuous paths. You can prove it. So there, this gives you a, a huge class of examples where it's natural for the compensator to have absolutely continuous paths. And the reason this is nice is because it lends itself to have an interpretation as a hazard. Right? So um, if you want to know the instantaneous likelihood of whatever bad event has happened, it doesn't have to be a bad event. Let's suppose you're waiting for a bus. You want to know when the bus comes, okay? So you, you, uh, you don't have any forewarning of when the, I mean, I know that in Paris now they tell you how many minutes until the next uh, 84 bus arrives, right? Does anybody ever believe that? Yeah? Nobody. 
But it does give you a guess, right? So if it says four minutes, you probably figure, well, it's going to be between three and five, or between two and seven, or between one and 12. I mean, you know, you know, but you have some idea, right? And so, but that doesn't mean you know. And so when the bus arrives, it's a complete surprise. Unless, of course, you can look down the street and see the bus at the previous stop. But let's suppose it's rounding a corner, and so you can't see it when it's coming. Then it's a complete surprise. So it's like a totally inaccessible time. And this is a happy totally inaccessible time because you have your bus. And so, um, but then you can talk about the hazard rate. What is the instantaneous probability it's going to arrive, given that it hasn't already arrived? And so that's what equation four is. It's the hazard rate. And I didn't name it a hazard rate, so you can't blame me, OK? Because everybody thinks in terms of bad things, right? Like, OK, so pretend it's time the bus breaks down, right? And then you don't see that coming either, do you? Right? And then that's a hazard rate. OK. Now, I have to have one more detail regarding stopping times. If you have a stopping time, and you have an event lambda, uh, which is in the stopping time sigma algebra f sub t, then you can form t lambda of omega as t of omega equals t of omega if lambda is in omega, and infinity if, uh, if omega, I'm sorry, t lambda of omega is equal to t of omega if omega is in lambda, and infinity if omega is not in lambda, OK? And then, of course, you can decompose every stopping time t into, into t lambda minimum t lambda complement, right? Because you're just getting rid of the infinities. And you can show, in a case of Hunt process, that t lambda is totally inaccessible and t lambda complement is predictable. So you can decompose a stopping time into its totally inaccessible part and its predictable part. And Paul Andre Mayer proved that if you have a Hunt Markov process and T is totally inaccessible, then lambda is exactly the set where the process jumps. So all the totally inaccessible stopping times of a Markov process come from the jumps of the Markov process. Okay? So it's a very nice way to look at it, I think. And uh, what are we going to do with this? So this brings us to Cox constructions of stopping times, which go back to David Lando around 1998. OK, and, uh, and later on, that was in his thesis work. And later on, he wrote a book called Credit Risk or something like that, where he goes into way too much detail. And so, so supposing now, Somebody walks into your office with a compensator and says, I want a stopping time that has this compensator. Now, don't ask why somebody would do that. But suppose somebody did. This was David Lando's question. How do you do that? Well, you can, f you can do it by saying t is the infimum of the integral of alpha s ds up to t well, this first time it's bigger than z, where z is an independent exponential random variable. So you have to introduce, you have to augment your space, probably, to get an independent exponential random variable that you can use to construct this stopping time. And that's the canonical method to construct totally inaccessible stopping times with a given compensator. OK. Um, on the other hand, what about the jumps of the underlying Hunt process? They're totally inaccessible, but they don't have an independent exponential random variable used to construct them. So how does that work? And that's, that's kind of the subject of the talk. It took a long time to get there, but. So the question is, are Cox constructions intrinsic to Markov processes? And hence, the jump times of Markov processes. And of course, like any good mathematician, I never ask a question unless I can answer it. 
unless, of course, in the spirit of, uh, of Pierre Lyon's, uh, where research is just failing better, I could answer this question more poorly, or I mean, less poorly. Okay, so, but anyway, we can show, this is what Andres has shown, that the jump times of Markov processes can undergo a Cox construction without having to introduce an independent exponential random variable, that they're, they're hidden within the, within the process themselves. And his idea is simply to use a change of time argument um, in, order to con in order to change the process to make it into a, uh, an exponential random variable like the first jump time of a Poisson process. And if the compensator of a Poisson process is t, I mean the compensator is t, min, min the stopping time, then an old theorem of Delacherie says it has to be exponential. Okay? Easy to prove directly. And then one can ask a converse, can we find, for any given totally inaccessible stopping time, a hunt process such that the stopping time is a jump time for the hunt process? And this was answered by our president, former president, Barack Obama, who said, yes, we can. <laughs> okay? No? Well, it's a famous phrase of Barack Obama, yes, we can. <laughs> Unlike Trump, whose famous phrase is, go to hell. <laughs> so, so anyway, so Barack Obama in 2008 said, yes, we can. And so you can do it. You can find a hunt process such that your stopping time is a jump time for the hunt process. And of course, it's trivial. So if T is a totally inaccessible time on a filtered complete probability space, we look at here, uh, this thing here, xt equals indicator t bigger than or equal to t, our usual device. And that itself is a Feller process, which is a, even better than a Hunt process. Okay? So, so we have this beautiful little duality. And then, when you think you're done, you get an email from Monique Jean Blanc, who asks, what about predictable times? Okay, can you, can you, is, can a predictable time be seen as the hitting process, as the hitting time of zero for a continuous process? Because predictable times are kind of associated with continuous processes and totally inaccessible with jump processes. So, kind of an analogy would be, if it's a predictable time, uh, can it be the hitting time of zero? I don't know why zero, but that's the way she posed the problem, so that's the way you answer it. And, uh, well, th this is pr pretty easy to do if you're, if you're just, in French, and tout petit peu louche. Okay, so, but I really like louche. I think it's a great word. We don't really have the same word in English. Maybe sleazy. You know, so if you're a little bit sleazy, you can, you can answer the question trivially. So if it's a predictable time, we know that we have a sequence of stopping times increasing to it, right? And so that's, it. that's our times Sn, always strictly less than t, but whose limit is t. And now, now we're calling it tau because it's predictable. And so we have uh, here at the bottom, we have Sn less than tau almost surely for every n. And we just use this sequence to construct um, the sought after process. So, I mean, the way we do this is we take, we take two stopping times, which are um, Sn and Sn plus one, and we draw a line between them. <laughs> okay, so linear interpolation. Now the problem with that I can see people starting to silently scream, is that it's anticipating, right? I mean, it, you have to know TN, tau n plus one to construct the line between tau n and tau n plus one. And you can't have something anticipa anticipating. But then there's the theory of enlargement of filtrations. 
So the theory of enlargement of filtration solves everything, always. And so you just throw in extra information, and then it's adapted to the larger filtration. And then you have a, uh, a very nice process that hits zero uh, when, uh, when you reach the predictable time. Now this, this, came, this question, I think, came about from some research of a guy, an English guy named Walther, who you've probably never heard of, because he's one of those guys who's super smart, does interesting things, and then sells out. You know? He went to work for industry. I think the finance industry. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do. I mean, there are people who invent weapons of mass destruction. There's this great movie about Oppenheimer. <laughs> but they don't talk about the construction, the, the shape of the first atomic bomb, which was a key insight, right? It had to be ellipsoidal. But that's probably too hard a concept for a popular movie audience, right? Anyway, so Walther um, also proved his own theorem, his own conjecture, which was that you can construct a continuous process that goes, that, that's hit zero at a given predictable stopping time. And his construction is better than ours because he doesn't have to enlarge the filtration. But it's super complicated. And, and you know, there is this famous French saying, pourquoi faire simple si on peut faire compliqué? <laughs> right? And uh, so you'd probably like, since all of you are French pretty much, you'd probably like uh, the complicated solution. But we're, I, we're from the new world and we like simple things. So our solution is simple. Okay, so I'm supposed to end in five minutes, but obviously I have ended. So thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for this very nice talk. Are there questions or comments? So I have a very naive question concerning the, do you hear me? Yeah. OK, fine. Uh, so you said that uh, in the, about the intri intrinsic aspect of the construction of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Cox construction, you said that you retrieve the exponential law, but you don't have necessarily uh, the, uh, the independence. Right. And uh, uh, is there any way, typically, to, to make a change of uh, probability to get uh, this independence, as we, are, as we usually do in uh, progressive enlargement? No, the point is you don't have to enlarge the space. The, uh, the Markov process already contains within it okay. the tools to uh, construct it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank again Philippe. <laughs>